We have so much we could hear from you on. I would love to hear your thoughts generally. You were with John Kerry at COP26. What were your reflections being there and post COP26 regarding where the US can go now in leading climate change uh, efforts for the world? Well, first of all, I want to just say, as for, thank you for having me. Congratulations to We Don't Have Time. We need you here in the US. We need your voice. We need your energy. We need your activism. We need you, you know, really pushing this. So thank you. Uh, and, and not just congratulations, but also welcome and let's get to work. Um, secondly, I just want to recognize the fact that uh, as amazing as, uh, as my boss is, as Special Presidential Envoy for Climate Kerry is, what was so impressive, I think, about COP is it was truly a whole of government representation. Um, I see my colleague, Kate Guy, over here, who works in a different part of the State Department that was very vocal and active and a key player at COP26. We had the Department of Transportation there with Secretary Buttigieg. We had NASA there. We had our Secretary of Energy there. We had our Secretary of Agriculture there. So it was truly wonderful to see the message that this was not just the biggest climate conference for the climate parts of our government, but that our entire government showed up because climate is integrated across everything that the Biden-Harris administration does. Secondly, I'll just say that the um, two other observations. Number one, we had, I feel, more concrete deliverables in addition to the U.S. going to the mat, working day and night, 24-7 around the clock to try and deliver the most ambitious outcomes possible in the negotiations. We had more concrete deliverables and initiatives started up that were launched at COP26 than I think has ever happened in any other COP before. You mentioned on forests, working to end deforestation by 2030. That involves nearly $20 billion in mobilized investments to help make that happen as well. We launched an agriculture innovation mission for climate that had an early harvest number that's only set to grow, but an early harvest number of $4 billion in increased spending over the next five years on climate smart ag innovation from adaptation technologies like more drought resistant crops to mitigation opportunities like electrified tractors and farm equipment, agri photovoltaics, low carbon fertilizers and the like. In addition to that, we had the Global Methane Pledge. We brought together over 100 countries, 70% of global GDP, nearly half of anthropogenic methane emissions to, to dramatically reduce the amount of methane that uh, the, the, the world puts out over the next 10 years. And I could go on and list many more. Our First Movers Coalition, mobilizing companies to take demand signals in 2030 for low carbon products and hard to abate sectors like steel, cement, shipping, trucking, aviation, and bring those commitments forward today so that we can have bankable contracts, so we can get suppliers to actually start making investment decisions on green steel facilities, on factories to put steel in the ground today. And I even see some representatives from some of our, uh, our first initial inaugural partners in the First Movers Coalition today. So for those of you who are here, thank you very much for the leadership that you're showing from the private sector as well. So um, we had a, you know, a, we, we showed up in a big way, not just in the negotiations, we showed up in a big way, not just in terms of the multiple different parts of the United States government, but I feel we also showed up in a big way in terms of launching initiatives that will have their own life and which actually aren't dependent, by the way, on who's sitting in the White House in Washington, on who's sitting, you know, in Congress or who has control of the House or the Senate just down the street. These are things that are going to have a life of their own that are going to shape and make markets and help drive us faster towards where we need to be to keep 1.5C within reach. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And you mentioned the methane pledge. There was a lot of excitement around that. And I know this administration has deep interest in agriculture and finding solutions that are innovative in that space. Talk to us a little bit about why we're prioritizing agriculture and innovation there. Absolutely. Well, you know, for so often, it, um, agriculture was a topic that a lot of people didn't touch when it came to climate change because it was uh, unnecessarily, in my mind, viewed as um, uh, a, a sector too sensitive to, to talk about, right? It's tied up with a lot of different considerations. And frankly, our farmers and our ranchers are the backbone of our country. Um, and so there was a desire to kind of make sure that, you know, that, that they were protected and looked out for. What I think was being neglected is the fact that we can address emissions in the agricultural sector and that we actually have to address climate change in the agricultural sector because our agriculture sector, our food systems are literally the front lines. They're the canary in the coal mine in terms of climatic changes. 
as as we see changing climate patterns, we're going to have changing, you know, uh, crop outlooks. We're going to have to rethink the way that we're feeding the world um, in a warming world that we're feeding a growing global middle class. And so we're going to have to adapt the agricultural sector to climate disruption. We see the from the flooding that we're getting in the Midwest to the droughts uh, and, and the increased desertification that we're seeing in the Middle East and other parts of the world um, and, and the challenges that a, that a continent like Africa is going to face in, in feeding its citizens over the, over the coming decades. We know we're going to have to adapt. But there are also, I think, as we started looking at the Global Methane Pledge and some of these other initiatives, we saw there are dramatic opportunities for the agriculture sector to reduce emissions without having any trade-off in terms of agricultural productivity or the viability and livelihoods of farmers and ranchers. But that comes through innovation. And frankly, we've underinvested in climate smart innovation in the clean in, in the agriculture sector. With the aim for climate initiative that I mentioned, the, the way I like to think about it is we will be successful if in Five years from today, at the end of that very time limited, very focused uh, period for this initiative, when you think of clean tech, you don't just think of Teslas and solar panels and wind turbines, which are all very important. But we're also thinking about the ag tech, the climate, you know, the food tech solutions, low carbon proteins. Um, like I said, agri photovoltaic, smart shading systems, right? Um, controlled growing environments that that offer much better resource utilization, much much better resource efficiency. If we're thinking about those sorts of innovations when we think about climate tech or clean tech, that's going to be success for this initiative, and that's going to be success for what the seeds we planted at COP26. Nice. Excellent. Thank you for giving us a little deeper insight into that sector in particular. We're really grateful you're in this role. We know we cannot keep the first ever presidential a special envoy uh, for climate. I hope I got that title accurate. Special, presidential, Pre envoy special for presidential envoy for climate waiting. And I know you have to shoot, but he's the first ever special presidential envoy for climate. So just as you before you head out, what are some other firsts you've encountered? And can we say America is now back leading the global charge to confront the climate crisis since the Paris Accords? There have been a lot of firsts. There have been a lot of firsts. Um, under our, you know, uh, the the year we've had um, working with our, you know, across government with so many partners and and um, and and like-minded partners around the world, we've seen the first uh, net zero 2050 commitment from a major oil and gas producer, a major hydrocarbon economy in the Middle East, in the UAE, right? And with a, with serious intentions to lay out a roadmap that's going to show how they're going to get there. We've seen um, for the first time China give up all financing of external coal unabated coal plants. We've seen, um, you know, uh, the internal examples as well. Secretary Kerry, you know, is uh, uh, was was pleased to participate in the first for the first time since 2015 a convening of our trade policy coordinating council that was focused largely on how do we build out a more robust clean tech capability in the United States so that we can be solutions exporters. Even as we ask countries to join us in raising ambition, are we making sure that we're in a position to walk with them hand in hand, to hold their hand through the process, to coach them through, and to recognize the transition is going to be difficult. Transition, the transition has challenges. Absolutely. We shouldn't ignore that. We shouldn't pretend that's not the truth. But we can absolutely be there in the United States and other like-minded countries in providing solutions to help them out. So to see that the, for the very first time since the Obama administration, this Trade Policy Coordinating Council was being convened and was focused on the climate crisis, that was really exciting. Um, we've had a lot of different firsts like that, and, uh, and I hope we're going to continue to have them as we head into 2022. That's awesome. Thank you so much for giving us your time and for sharing your thoughts with us. Please join me in a round of applause for David Livingston, Thank Senior you. Advisor to Thank John Kerry. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you.